you have your bulletins, inside you'll find your notes. <clears throat> Let's go before the Lord in prayer and ask him to bless this time. Father, we ask for your help at this time that you would help us in our hearts and our minds, that you would grant us to have ears to hear and eyes to see and hearts to understand, that we would see Christ, that we would believe in Christ, that we would know what it is on a deeper level to have fellowship and communion with him, that we would be strengthened and filled with your spirit, that all of these things would be for your glory, for our good and for the good of your body collectively. Work within us now as only you can do. We humbly ask in Christ. Amen. <laughs> Nothing is more desirable and even craved by you, Christ's people, than a deeper and more intimate communion with Jesus Christ. What would it mean to know Him more fully, to see Him in His true beauty, to taste Him with the whole soul, to be able to hear the sweet melody of His voice, and to smell the aroma of His sacrifice, and to feel His strong presence within to love Him, even as He loves us. And nothing is more desired by me than that you would have that. And as you all know, for those that are outside of Christ, for those that have a, what we would call historical faith, an intellectual faith, where you would agree with all the points of the doctrine, but there has been no receiving of Christ, there has been no consuming Christ. There has been no relationship of fellowship and endearing and love to Christ, along with all who deny Christ as sovereign Lord, deny Him as eternal God, and deny the work of His Spirit and are destitute of this Spirit. You'll never know this love. You'll never know the peace that it brings. You'll never know the hope that is in Christ, or the joy that it is to know Him and to be known by Him, unless you receive, and unless you feast upon Christ, even now, by faith. It's through the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ, it's through the quickening of the Spirit of Christ, that sinners, just like us, our living souls become alive and take hold of the person of Christ by faith. And this is only possible because it is a purchased union. This is not something that we can do in and of ourselves. This isn't something that we could do apart from Christ. It's only possible because of a purchased union. Now, how is this union with Christ purchased? And as we know, it starts in eternity past with a plan. But when a king makes a plan, we call it a decree. And with one who has all authority and all power, this is a glorious decree. It is an unbreakable decree. No one, as Job says, can thwart his plan. No one can slap his hand. No one can say to him, what are you doing? And so this union and this plan of being purchased and brought into a union comes from the eternal decree of the Father. The person of the eternal Son condescends. He does so by the eternal Spirit and takes on flesh. And in this, we get a glimpse into what theologians call Trinitarian particularism. I know it's a big fancy term, but in that, what we see is 
Every single person within the Trinity all works towards the same goal all the time. There is perfect unity within the Trinity. And when we see the works of the Trinity moving outside, it's always unified, just as it is on the inside. The Father works for those in salvation, just as the Son works for those in salvation, just as the Spirit works for those in salvation. They're not at odds with one another. And it is by this decree of the Father, willingness of the Son, and by the eternal Spirit overshadowing a young virgin girl that he takes on flesh. And the Son assumes humanity, body and soul, for us, for an eternally loved people, and for our salvation. And our Savior lived a life of perfect, joyful obedience Loving obedience to his eternal Father. And what did that look like? That Christ, the King of kings and Lord of lords, came and took the place of a servant to procure life for his enemies. For we were his enemies, and some of you still are his enemies. And Christ was sanctified by the Holy Spirit from the womb and then empowered by the Spirit when he rose up out of the waters of a baptism of repentance so that he would begin his eternal ministry of prophet, priest, and king. Offices he already held, but that we would see gloriously displayed in the flesh. Why a prophet? To instruct us in the way, because we're ignorant and we're blind. Why a priest? To intercede, to sacrifice, satisfy justice, because we broke the law. We are sinful, wicked, and rebellious. And the king to subdue in us all disobedience. To subdue in us all disobedience through His rightful power. And through all of this accomplishment and all of this perfection and all of this beauty and all of this obedience unto the Father, what He received was death on a cursed tree. He gave up His own life as a substitute to stand, to hang in the place of sinners. And so for each one of us in Christ, we can say in truth, condemned, he was hung in my place. In my place. My prophet. My priest. My king. My God. In my place. But then how is it that the accomplishment of Christ becomes mine. And so we look at how union with Christ is applied. Now it's by that same eternal spirit that raised Christ from death, the same spirit who overshadowed Mary, the same spirit who descended upon him as a dove coming up out of the waters of a baptism of repentance, it's this Holy Spirit through whom Christ offered himself without blemish, with blood, to the Father. And we remember from what we studied last week. John says, I baptize with water, but one is coming and he will baptize with the Holy Spirit and with fire. He will immerse some in the Holy Spirit and he will immerse some in judgment fire. And we saw that it is Christ, hands on, taking his people one by one, name by name, soul by soul, person by person, 
and handing them to the Spirit, placing them into the Spirit so that He would flood all around, inside and outside of that person. And then what the Spirit does in 1 Corinthians 12, 13 is then takes that person and places them in the body of Christ. And it's interesting. The same Holy Spirit not only places us in Christ, He doesn't leave us as dead sinners, but just change our location. Now you were in Adam, dead, and now I'll move your location, but you're still dead. No, He takes the life of Christ because we have a living Savior, and He takes the death of Christ because He died as a substitute in our place, and He takes the resurrection of Christ because He defeated sin, death, Satan, and he takes the ascension and the seating of Christ at the Father's right hand, and he takes all of these benefits and more, and then he makes them ours. It's in Christ that we have every spiritual blessing, but the Holy Spirit is the bond of this union. He is the glue that holds us together. There is enough to think on and meditate on to last centuries just in what we've briefly covered. Do we not know that we have a rich treasury of blessings? That we have an infinite ocean of graces That we have a lavish abundance of mercies. An ample storehouse full of power. that can never be exhausted. We also have a constant comfort of fellowship. An eternal wellspring of love. In Christ Jesus, loved ones, we have everything we need to supply all of our wants. Is there any lack that you have? Christ supplies it. Is there growth that you need? Christ supplies it. Is it forgiveness? It's found in Christ. Is it life? Is it hope? Is it peace? Is it joy? Is it satisfaction? All of it is found in Christ and in Christ alone. Think about if you had everything that you need for your physical life stored up in your closet. Food. Water. Clothes. Money. Everything. When you're hungry and you're thirsty... When you're cold, when you're in debt, what would you do? Where would you go? To your closet to get everything that you need. And you would do it as a knee jerk reaction, as a reflex, without even thinking. So ask yourself why? Why is it when I have needs, I don't go to my closet and seek the face of my Father through His Son, by His Spirit? Why is it when I have needs, I don't go to this treasure trove of riches that are found only in Christ? We need to labor to take hold of what was purchased for us. You remember the weeks that we spent in Ephesians 1. I'm praying that you would know, not that you'd get more stuff, but that you would know what you already have. And to our shame, we don't have because we don't ask. But if we meditate on and look towards this person of Christ, 
And we realize that all of these blessings that were purchased for us were purchased with precious blood. That they are there by the Spirit that He's given us to be used for the glory of His great name and for the beauty of His bride. So then, how is communion with Christ cultivated? Let's look at Philippians 2. A well-known verse. You know it well. Philippians chapter 2. In chapter 129, he says that it is a gift for Christ's sake that you not only believe, exercise faith in Christ, but also to suffer for his sake. And then in chapter 2, verses 1 to 4, he gets into how to pursue unity within the body. It's not by lifting yourself up with your empty glory. It's by this, verse 5, Have this way of thinking in yourselves, which is also in Christ Jesus, who, although existing in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a slave, by being made in the likeness of men. He's not divesting himself of any attributes. He's veiling his glory by assuming human flesh. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient. Have you ever paused and meditated on that? By becoming obedient. To whom would he ever have to obey? True God of true God. No one gives God commands with any rightful authority. Now we are creatures. We have a right and a responsibility and a mandate to obey. The very life that we have is not our own. Now, there is one sense in which you could say, this is my heart, this is my stomach, and all of the organs inside are my organs. But there's another sense in which you could say, none of these belong to me, they're all gifts from another. And the only reason that they operate is because he desires that they do. And yet this one, Jesus Christ, will humble himself unto obedience, and I will not. And what kind of obedience is it? By becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God also highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow, of those who are in heaven and on earth, and under the earth. And every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, that He is Yahweh, to the glory of God the Father. This is our Savior. Yahweh, the Creator and Sustainer of all things. There is no other God beside this God. And Christ accomplished not only our salvation... He resubjugated everything that Adam failed, everything that you failed, he has accomplished. And that day will come in but a blink of an eye. Every knee will bow, every tongue will confess. And we want that to be a time of rejoicing. We don't want that to be a time of terror for those that are outside of Christ. That's all it will be. We don't want that to be a time of, I knew I had more in me. I should have, would have, could have, but I didn't. And this is the grounding for verse 12. So then... In light of this fact, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, 
not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence. The idea is nobody's paying attention, nobody's looking, nobody's watching. You don't have a taskmaster. Out of your own will, and your own joy, and your own love for Christ, you are obedient when no one's looking. He says this, Work out your salvation with fear and trembling because it is God who is at work in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. So what's going on? Is this like when you're carrying a table and you've got four guys carrying the table and the table weighs 500 pounds? You go, well, you were, I mean, I was on the bottom of it going up the stairs, so I, you know, we, the two of us on the stairs, probably got like 350 pounds, and you guys only got like 75 apiece. Is it coordinate like that? No. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. This doesn't alleviate us from doing, this isn't let go and let God. There is no let go and let God in the scripture. We labor with the strength that he's provided. No one for a moment would say, Well, this is what we do. We pray the Lord's Prayer, the disciples' prayer. Give us this day our daily bread. And then we go and we play Minecraft. And we wait. And he fed Elijah with ravens. He could feed us too. No, and then we go out and we work. Because look at what he's already given us. Hands and feet and eyes and ears and a mind and a a rational ability to be able to think and to calculate and to plan. And he's still working in every single person here. Not in the same way. Different between the regenerate and the unregenerate. But all of us have our life from him. There is no life apart from him. And so he gives life. And to us in Christ, he gives new life. And he is working to will his good pleasure and to work his good pleasure. And he's given us a road map. And he's given us a family. And he's given us access through prayer to him. He's given us everything that we need. And so we labor according to the strength God provides And so much so that Paul says, if you turn over a couple chapters to chapter 4, verse 11 says, not that I speak from want, I'm not lacking anything, because I learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am. I know how to get along with humble means, and I also know how to live in abundance, both of which can be challenging. If you think your problem is, I just don't have enough money, it's not your problem. Because the more you have, the more problems, the more trials you're going to have. It doesn't make it easier, it makes it harder. He says, in any and all things I have learned, which meant he needed to study. I have learned the secret of being filled And going hungry, both of having abundance and suffering needs. What is this secret, Paul? I wish you'd just share it with us. And he does. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. This is how communion with Christ is cultivated. It's the grace of God actively working in us and it motivates us and it also transforms us at the same time. And he does this in primarily a handful of ways 
And we call these ways ordinary means of grace. Ordinary means of grace. The first is patently obvious to us. It is the Word of God. The second, prayer. And associated with that, fasting. The third, fellowship. The fourth would be trials. Those are love gifts from our Father. Obedience. And the sacraments. Now, in and of themselves, you'll notice in the title, they're called ordinary. Ordinary. In and of themselves, there's nothing special about them. Anyone can partake. People can pretend to have fellowship. Non-believers pray and fast. Everybody has some kind of a trial. Everybody obeys somebody. A lot of people read their Bibles. And unbelievers have been baptized and partake of the Lord's table. Anyone can partake, but that doesn't make them effectual because they're just ordinary means of grace. They're made effectual through the working of the Holy Spirit in applying the life and the benefits of Christ to us by faith. From one degree of glory to another, moment by moment, they change us into conformity to Christ, or we could say, obedient holiness. Obedient holiness, just like our Lord. And so let's define sacrament, because that's our focus, defining sacrament. One thing you'll probably notice, the sacrament is not a word that's used in Scripture. And some people like to wrangle about words because of that, and they like to make empty arguments. But there's so many ways you can refute that. The Bible wasn't written in English, so none of these words are in the Bible, literally. The word Trinity isn't a word used in Scripture either, but what does it do for us? It communicates a theological truth, consubstantial, co-essential. As we're defining these terms so that we can have positives and negatives to build a safeguard around them so that we can better understand and protect and guard the theological truth that we're seeking to express. So sacrament is used to translate the Greek word mystery, in a number of cases in the Bible. The idea, the meaning behind it is to hallow a thing. Think Matthew chapter 6. Hallowed be your name. That means to holify, if that's a word. To make holy. To dedicate it unto holiness. And the two sacraments that we see in Scripture are the sacrament of baptism and the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. Now, because they're ordinary means of grace, water is water. Bread is bread. And wine is wine. Unless it's juice. And you know what's interesting? Is when we go back to the source and we look at the source, we see the same pattern. The humanity of Christ was just that. It wasn't commingled with divinity. He didn't have a different kind of humanity than we have, except that he was free from sin. He had humanity, flesh, bone, rational soul, the same as ours, yet without sin. So we could say it was just like Adam before the fall. but it was holy by the virtue of its union to the Son. That's one thing that's interesting. All of us, when we are created, when we're conceived, our body begins to grow. We have a rational soul. That begins to grow. And we are a person. 
But when the Holy Spirit overshadows Mary, it's not creating another person. That overshadowing doesn't mean to create a person. The Holy Spirit is creating a body and a rational soul, and it is assumed by the eternal person, the Son of God. And you have two natures, unmixed, not separate, distinct, but united in the one person. We'll get to that more. The sacrament is a holy thing to be received with a holy mind. This term sacrament was used by soldiers when they would enlist and bind themselves in a solemn oath to be faithful to their commander and to their military. This oath that they would take would be called a sacrament. Now, for something to be a sacrament from Scripture, there has to be a few prerequisites. First, there has to be a command from Christ. And then second, there has to be a promise. And then third, a sign that seals. A sign that seals. When we saw the rainbow yesterday, for those of us that saw the rainbow, we didn't just think, oh, cool, beautiful colors of light. We were reminded, because it was linked with something else, the promise of God not to flood the earth with water, not to destroy every living thing as he had done, saving only one family. But the rainbow is not the promise. And so, for the New Testament, this gives us two sacraments, baptism and the Lord's Supper. Water baptism, as we went over last week, is a sign and a seal of Holy Spirit baptism. There's regeneration, there's union with Christ, it's our entrance into the Christian life, whereby we become members of the body of Christ. And that's why when you see it in Scripture, you see it linked up with membership, local church membership. The second, Lord's Supper, is a sign and seal of the new covenant. This is the new covenant in my blood. The bread represents the body of Christ. The wine represents the blood of Christ. And it's a picture of our ongoing union and our communion communing with Christ. It's our spiritual food for our earthly pilgrimage. So what's the relationship between the sign and the reality signified? Well, let's look at those two components. Sign and reality, thing signified. You have the sign and you have the thing that it's signifying. And so we have two, so we know it's not the same. Just like this, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. Meaning, there's a distinction. Even though the Word, eternally existing, was, as to His quality of nature, God, there's a distinction. The sign is not the reality. The reality is not the sign. They are distinct, but they are inseparable. They're distinct, but they're inseparable. And they're inseparable because of the Word of God and the promise. And if you look at the back bottom of your page of notes, you'll see the similarity on the left-hand side. In Christ, you have two natures united in one person. The divine nature does not become human. The human nature does not become divine. They are distinct, but they are inseparable. You have the promise of bread and body. You have the promise of wine being blood. Now, there's two extremes that we have to avoid when we're looking at this. And the first is ex opere operato. Ex opere operato, which is Latin for out of the operation it operates, which is kind of just like vending machine. You put this in, you get that out, like a calculator. It just, it just operates, it just does it. You come up to any means of grace, 
and automatically they give you grace. No matter your disposition, no matter your heart, no matter your standing with God, there's grace that's received by you. Ex opere operato. It's interesting that Jesus says you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. Implying you don't. Not in the scriptures. He says it is them that testify about me. Now the scriptures are a means of grace. But they don't automatically give grace. And neither do the sacraments. Neither does the supper. The other extreme we have to avoid, in keeping with Latin, is signa nuda. I bet you can guess what that means. A naked sign. A naked sign. That it's just a picture and that's it. But I want us to understand that in the supper, we truly feast on Christ. In the supper, we truly feast on Christ. We feast on his flesh, and we drink his blood. Think about John 6. But at the same time, the bread and the wine begin as, remain as, bread and wine. So what these signs of the sacrament signify externally, the Holy Spirit accomplishes internally, just as in water baptism. It's not the water baptism that regenerates us. It's the washing of the Spirit that regenerates us. It's the work of the Spirit on the inside and uniting us to Christ that regenerates us. And so the supper is not effectual without the Spirit's work. But, nor is the supper an empty sign. Christ is present in the bread. Christ is present in the wine, while His body remains locally in heaven. As Acts 3 says, He must remain. Heaven must receive Him until the appropriate time. And if He has a body that can be in more than one place at one time, He does not have a body like unto us. Which means that we are still dead in our sins and we have no Savior. He could redeem other beings that possibly might be able to have some kind of body in more than one place at one time. But we don't. And the scripture says, since the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same. His body remains locationally in heaven. And this is not something that's very hard for you. You know this. Look at Exodus 3. Exodus 3. Now Moses was pasturing the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of Yahweh appeared to him in a blazing fire from the midst of the bush. So what does the scripture say? Who appeared to him from the midst of the bush? The angel of Yahweh. Very good. Hold on to that. And he looked... And behold, the bush was burning with fire, yet the bush was not consumed. So Moses said, I must turn aside now and see this marvelous sight, why the bush is not burned up. And Yahweh saw that he turned aside to look. So God called to him from the midst of the bush. Who called to him from the midst of the bush? Who appeared in the midst of the bush? There you go. Good job. God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. Then he said, do not come near here. Remove your sandals from your feet for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. So question for you. Was God at that time 
omnipresent or not omnipresent? Did he become omnipresent later? He already was. So then the next question we have to ask is, was the fire present and visible to all men? Was every square inch of this earth considered holy ground like that place? In verse 5, the place on which you are standing is holy ground. So everybody all over the world at this time took off their sandals. Because no matter where they were, it was holy ground because God's omnipresent. This is how we think through and we identify categories. What we see is that all of earth and the ground did not become sacramentum, but we see the special presence of Yahweh in revealing himself here. The special presence of Yahweh. We also see his aseity, his self-sufficiency. The bush isn't consumed. The life source of the fire is coming from somewhere else. It's not consuming the bush, which is normally what fires do. But how do we see it? We see it through the Word. We see it by the Spirit, in His Word, through faith. But let's look over at Exodus 33. How did Moses see God's glory? Exodus 33, we'll start in 18. He says, uh, Moses said, I pray you, show me your glory. And he said, I myself will make all my goodness pass before you, and I will proclaim the name of Yahweh before you, and I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I'll show compassion on whom I'll show compassion. You cannot see my face, for no man can see me and live, but I will proclaim my name to you. Then Yahweh said, Behold, there's a place by me. There's a place by me. Isn't everything by you, in him? And you shall stand there on the rock, and it will come about when my glory is passing by that I will put you in the cleft of the rock and cover you with my hand until I've passed by. Then I'll remove my hand and you will see my back. But my face shall not be seen. Look at 34, 5. And Yahweh descended in the cloud and stood there with him, and he called upon the name of Yahweh. Then Yahweh passed by in front of him and called out, Yahweh, Yahweh God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness and truth, who keeps loving kindness for thousands, who forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin. Yet he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and on the grandchildren to the third and the fourth generations. And Moses made haste to bow low toward the earth and worship. How did Moses see God's glory? Through the proclamation of the word. Through the proclamation of the word. As Yahweh proclaimed his word to him, he saw his glory. So we've seen Yahweh is omnipresent, yet manifests himself with a special presence, through signs accompanied with what? The Word. The Word. This is why you can't have, as some churches do, prepackaged communion, and you grab it on your way out and just take it. That's one of the reasons why there's a whole host of others. It must be accompanied with the Word, not only in its inception, but in its utilization and its reception also. So, Now, in the supper, there is a sign, there's a reality. They're distinct, but they're, what's the word? Inseparable, because of the promised union of the two through the word. So then, what is the purpose of the sacrament? What is the purpose of the sacrament? And there's a whole host. I'll I'll just give you several right now. A proclamation of Christ's death. We proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. A time of thanksgiving for all that Christ has done. So when you think about these, think about how do I normally come to the Lord's table? Because this is all very practical. How do I normally come to the Lord's table? If I passed out some cards to all of you after the service with some questions like, so what did you do during communion? What were you thinking about? How were you partaking? 
How did it, what were you thinking about? What were you feeling? What would you say? Because some people think, oh, you've got to come bloody knees and you've got to be careful and mope up. It is a solemn time. But it's also a joyous time. And there's so many different aspects going on in, in the supper. And there's so many different ways that we've lived throughout the week that one person may come to the supper broken and in tears, crying, and another with a smile from ear to ear and his heart full of joy. And that doesn't mean that one's taking it right and one's taking it wrong. A proclamation of Christ's death, a time of thanksgiving for all Christ has done, a public testimony of our union and dependence upon Christ, a call to repentance as we're standing faced with taking in a worthy manner, an invitation to reconciliation and unity within the body. It's something that you might not know. The Lord's Supper is a medicine for all our ailments. It is a balm for the sicknesses and the hurts and the pains and the griefs of our souls. It's a rededication to Christ. It's interesting, because churches won't follow what it says in Scripture, they make up all these things. Who wants to rededicate your life to Christ? Walk up this aisle. You don't see that in Scripture. You don't see that anywhere. Raise your hand and secretly profess what's supposed to be done publicly. You don't see that in Scripture. They're replacing the sacraments with man-made sacraments. They're taking that which is profane and just arbitrarily calling it holy. But there is a legitimate aspect in which we are recommitting ourselves to Christ in this very moment that we partake. That we are receiving at that same time by faith a declaration of assurance from Christ. He did accomplish what he said he would do. He did give me what he said he has given me. And though I cannot see it with the eyes of my flesh, I know it with the eyes of my heart and I see it because of the means of grace that he's given to me. And this, out of all the means of grace, is the most special, I would argue. Again, it can't be separated from the word. And it cannot be separated from prayer. But there's a sense in which in the supper we receive Christ better. God condescends even more to our weakness and our frailty and our flesh. Because with the word, we can see it with our eyes. We can hear it with our ears. But that's really all, all the senses that we have interacting. You can't touch a word because a word is just a token of something else. It's a representation of a reality. The word horse. I could write horse in all caps. And you could come touch the sign with the word on it, but you're not touching a horse. But in the supper, our fingers get involved. Our eyes are involved. Our ears are involved as we're eating and drinking and as we're doing it together. Our taste is involved. It's also a joyful celebration. Many often times in Scripture, wine is used for celebration because it makes the heart glad. And again, it's used to nourish our souls for the journey, which is what bread does. So then, how is Christ received in the supper? How is Christ received in the supper? And we'll probably spend a couple weeks on this. And if you've been following along with us, even just today, you might be able to pick this up. True believers experience Christ by the Spirit, not the flesh. Consider all the poor souls that knew Christ according to the flesh. Because there were many people 
And maybe even you've said, oh, I just really wish I was alive during the time when Jesus walked the earth. I think that would help strengthen my faith. That's not what the Bible says. You know, where you're getting that idea from, but you're focusing far too much on the flesh. There were many people that were healed by Christ physically, that died in their sins and went to hell. Some of them that saw these miracles had him crucified. Some people touched his flesh and splattered his blood and broke his flesh open and had Christ's physical blood on their bodies as they were breaking his flesh open. That didn't heal them. Judas was a disciple of Christ. He heard every one of Christ's sermons. And for what? True believers experience Christ by the Spirit, not the flesh. So when the believer, by faith, receives the bread into his mouth, at that very same time, he also receives Christ in his soul. And when the believer, by faith, drinks the wine, he drinks into his soul the life-giving blood of Christ by his Spirit who dwells within us. This is, this is the part that so many people miss, and I missed for a long time. We, we don't need to bring Christ's flesh down to earth. We are indwelt by his Holy Spirit. We lift up our eyes and we lift up our hearts to him where he is at the right hand of the Father in heaven. And his Spirit, who is indwelling us, who knows no bounds of time or space, or matter, he takes the flesh of Christ and so that we may consume Christ with the mouth of our souls. And it's not as if Christ is unwilling. Christ faithfully feeds us who remain on earth with his own flesh by his spirit that he's caused to dwell within us. 1 Corinthians 15.45 says, So also it is written, the first man Adam became a life became a living soul. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. And let's look over at John 13. And we'll just highlight some sections from his last night. Now before the feast of the Passover, Jesus, knowing that his hour had come, that he would depart out of this world to the Father, notice this, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. He loved them to the end. And as this unfolds, we see that that's not just up until he got to the cross. Because he even said, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. And he did. And here we see a picture of how he loves his people. And for us who are in Christ, he loves us to the end. He's not going to give us a jump start. This, we're not Adam. We're in Christ. It's not that there's a jump start. Here's a new creation. Here's a really nice garden. The rest is up to you. He loves us to the end. So will Christ not be faithful to those that he loves? Look over at John 14, 16. And I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate that he may be with you forever. The spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it does not see him or know him. You know him because he abides with you and will be in you. He can't be in them yet because Christ was not yet glorified, as John says earlier, because he's going to take that which belongs to Christ to give to Christ's people. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. After a little while, the world will no longer see me, but you will see me because I live, you will live also. 
You will live because I live. I will make sure of that. And then John 16, 13. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all the truth. For he will not speak from himself, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will disclose to you what is to come. Notice how he's going to do that in verse 14. He will glorify me, for he will take of mine and will disclose it to you. All things that the Father has are mine, therefore I said he takes of mine and will disclose it to you. This is a very important point. What is it that he is giving to us? Is it only spiritual? And is it only spiritual on the side of Christ? And is it only spiritual on the side of us? So we could ask the question a different way. Could Christ have come without flesh and blood, lived a perfect life, died a sacrificial death, and then be raised again for us and for our justification? So what is it from Christ that the Spirit is going to take and communicate to us? The whole person. The whole person. And so when we receive the Holy Spirit, we're not merely made partakers of the Holy Spirit. That is a glorious and a wonderful and a beautiful truth in and of itself, but that's not all that it is and all that it implies. It's by the Spirit we are made partakers of Christ. It's Christ and Christ alone that is the only food for the soul. And think about how much you spend laboring for the food that perishes and how little effort you give to pursuing Christ, the only food for your soul. The gracious bread of Jesus nourishes your eternal soul. And it's only Jesus Christ as the God-man that can make you alive and keep you that way. He's heavenly food that revives dead men. He's heavenly manna that sustains the life of the soul. Think about that. Our souls in themselves are dead. But Christ is life. And so the Spirit applies Christ to us. Our souls in themselves are weak, but Christ is mighty, so the Spirit gives us of His strength. Our souls in themselves are foolish, but Christ in Himself is wisdom. All the treasures of wisdom are found in Christ, and we have the mind of Christ by the Spirit who gives it to us. Our souls in themselves are bitter, but Christ Himself is sweet. And it's the Holy Spirit who establishes the living bond between Christ and his people. He brings us to Christ, but that's not it, because he also brings Christ to us. It's a two-way bond. Think about 2 Corinthians 5.21. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, so that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. There is an exchange going on there. So much so that Christ is still in the flesh, in heaven, having a body like unto ours, at the right hand of the Father, which is why His intercession is so perfect. He understands our weaknesses, having lived through weakness, but He also has an instrument like unto us, so He can sympathize with our weaknesses in the most of intimate ways. He's feeling what we're going through. We're receiving what we need from Him. And it's the Spirit that does this. You could put it this way. He officiates the wedding. Bringing the bride to the bridegroom. He implants the life of Christ in us and He grafts us into Christ and His life. Into His body. And we receive everything from our head. And it's the Spirit who is actively communicating that within us. We have no benefits, it's true, apart from Christ. Nothing, none whatsoever. Nobody has any lasting benefit apart from Christ. 
But apart from the Holy Spirit, you have no Christ. You look at him from afar, but you don't partake at all because you're not united to him. And it's only the Holy Spirit who is that loving bond that brings us together and holds us together and sustains us. But he doesn't sustain us from himself. He sustains us from Jesus Christ. We have no Christ apart from the Spirit. So think about this with me. Look at 1 Thessalonians 5. I wonder how important you think it might be not to quench the Spirit. As it says in verse 19, not to stifle Him, not to suppress Him, not to extinguish Him. So then the next question you should be asking is, well, how does one quench the Spirit? And in the context here, there's no less than a 14-fold exhortation. There's a failure to esteem and love church leaders, starting in verse 12. A failure to seek peace with other Christians. A failure to admonish the unruly. A failure to encourage the faint-hearted. A failure to help the weak. A failure to be patient. Or, positively, being vengeful. A failure to pursue moral goodness in every area of your life. Not rejoicing. Always. Not praying without ceasing. So haphazard prayer here and there. Not giving thanks in all things, but grumbling and complaining. A failure to love the Word of God. A failure to test all matters. And a failure to abstain from evil. So think about that and ask, do you see the importance of a daily pursuit of Christ by His Spirit living within you? Imagine what today would be like for you preparing to come to the Lord's table had you not quenched the Spirit all throughout last week. How much of a joy and a celebration do you think this would be, right? An anticipation, ready to partake, sins forgiven in Christ, good works accrued because of Christ in me, not because of myself. And I have been storing up Hope looking forward to this moment when I am going to join with my brothers and sisters as we feast on Christ, on His flesh, on His blood. And we receive by the Spirit the food that we need to energize us for even more holiness starting today. We need... And we should want to live glorious lives that radiate Christ. Now, just as a caution, our our stumbling is not a cause for abstaining from the Lord's Supper. We're commanded to partake, and we're commanded to partake in a worthy manner. But if you find yourself every week just coming and just repenting, not that it's bad to repent, but repenting for something that you know you ought not have done in the first place, or you're repenting for the same old things in the same old ways. When will you, when will you stop? When will you begin to trust Christ that you're no longer under the power of sin, that sin has no dominion over you anymore, that you've been set free in Christ? That you're united to Christ, and so all the benefits of Christ are also yours in Christ by His Spirit. I don't have to give in to this sin, and I already know it's not going to give me joy, and it's not going to give me pleasure. There's not going to be any satisfaction. It's going to give me shame. I don't want to quench the Spirit by whom I'm united to, Christ, through whom I commune with Christ. And so, if you have failures this week, as all of us do, but some that have not yet been repented of don't abstain from the Lord's table, they're a call to repentance. But I want us to seriously think about how our daily living affects our supper. Do you want to sup with Christ next week? Is that what you want to do? That starts right now. 
for every one of us. You know that we have a feast prepared almost every week. Why do we call it a feast? Well, what's a feast compared to an ordinary meal? We call those provisions feasts when they exceed the normal meal. And though physically all that we're seeing is a little bit of wine and a little bit of bread, and the bread will increase in a couple of weeks when we move over to unleavened bread and wine, our souls are able to feast on so much more. Notice the provision of God in Christ. It's a majestic feast. It's meant to feed our souls, to sustain us with life and joy and satisfaction. It is the bread of heaven upon which we feast. And it's given to us at the cost of Christ's blood. And in this feast, there's so many opportunities for, for our eyes to fix upon because we have every kind of blessing for our souls. What are your spiritual taste buds needing that day? There's food for your mind. There's food for your heart. There's food for your affections. There's food for your desires. There's food for your hope. Christ has them all. Because that food is Christ. I think it's appropriate to read Isaiah 55 together. Thinking about the application that it has for what we've just covered. Isaiah 55. Ho, oh, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come, buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why do you spend your money for what is not bread and your wages for what does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me and eat what is good and delight your soul in richness. Incline your ear and come to me. Listen so that your soul may live and I will cut an everlasting covenant with you according to the faithful loving kindnesses of David. Behold, I have given him as a witness to the peoples, a ruler and a commander for the peoples. Behold, you, singular, will call a nation you do not know, and a nation which knows you not will run to you, because of Yahweh your God, even the Holy One of Israel, for he has adorned you with beautiful glory. That's what we're doing. We are a nation that is not Israel. And we are running to him who is adorned with beautiful glory. Seek Yahweh while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return to Yahweh and he will have compassion on him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. And then one more for us to think through as we're preparing our hearts. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Verse 16 reads, Therefore we do not lose heart, but though our outer man is decaying, yet our inner man is being renewed day by day. For our momentary light affliction is working out for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison, while we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen, eternal. Now in the context here, he's talking about trials. How trials, when rightly viewed, looking unto Christ, grow us. But today we have this privilege, and by Christ, this right to come and partake of his flesh and blood, this need that we have to come and partake of his flesh and blood by faith, looking through the signs to the thing signified, which is Christ himself, that we would feast upon him and that he would refresh and nourish and strengthen our souls on this pilgrimage, this short earthly pilgrimage that we have until we make it all the way home to be with Christ. So let's prepare our hearts for that meal today. And let's also think about preparing our hearts starting today for the meal to come in the week following that we know will come.
Let's pray. Father, thank you that you have given us Christ in all of his offices, that you've given us every blessing in Christ, that you've shown the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ into our hearts, that you've given us the light of the knowledge of the glory of you in the face of Christ, and that you have given us your word to strengthen and to direct us, and through your word you have given us the supper, that we might be strengthened, that we might be encouraged, that we would be humbled, that we would have food for our affections and our desires and our mind and our heart, and that all of this food would be found only in one person, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen.